as I said, um, I'm Phil Riches, and I'm going to be talking about um, experimental tissue mechanics and also modelling. Okay. So I'm going to briefly describe uh, viscoelasticity and poroelasticity. Okay, because for these, uh, for me, these models uh, just are able to describe the time dependency of tissues. I'm going to start off with a brief experiment. Okay, just to give you an example of uh, experimental data. And then we'll go on to the theory. Um, I think importantly, I want to describe the physical characteristics of these tissues. So, you, in your mind, you can actually get an understanding physically what's going on in these tissues when they deform. I think that's really important. And whether we've got any experimental evidence as to whether these physical characteristics are actually um, happening in the tissues. So, what, what we predict numerically is there any evidence that it's happening in the tissues themselves? Uh, briefly comment how to then extract some material parameters and well the data that we're going to get from there whilst thematically speaking uh, we're going to I'm going to run some inverse dynamics and we'll get some data out so we'll do a live experiment and I'm going to finish on uh, an extension to poor elasticity view sort of triphasic and quadriphasic and discuss that in importance as well especially with regards to fluid flow okay so that's my uh, desire in, in, in one hour. It's a lot to get through in one hour. I speak quickly. So if you've just landed into Glasgow and you're still adjusting your, um, your language to my, uh, I apologize. But if, uh, I'm very happy to be interrupted. So Phil, can you say that again? So, okay, so please interrupt me if you need to. Okay, Himadri is going to then do part two. Hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes break halfway through through to give your mind a bit of a rest, okay, and to recover uh, before moving on to Himadri. I'll try and time it so I finish uh, five minutes to, uh, to 11 o'clock. And Himadri is going to be, uh, can introduce himself. Okay, so part one. I thought, um, I thought I'd start off by giving you my interpretation of why uh, tissue mechanics is important. I think it's a fantastic subject. I'm really enthusiastic about it. I love it. I'm, 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 I'm really happy that 20 people are in this room wanting to listen to me. It's great. Okay. Uh, I'm interested in why uh, tissues fail. Uh, my PhD was supervised or examined by Professor John Curry. Okay. Um, uh, John Curry is big in the field of bone mechanics. Ever since the early 60s, uh, 1960s, he'd been published, publishing papers in bone mechanics. And he gave me a piece of advice. It says, find a really good research question. Okay, and his research question, which, he's, which served him all throughout his life, was why do bones break? And so everything that he did was related to that question. I'm still struggling to find my question. I'm not quite as uh, focused as John, and he's uh, um, um, done a lot better because of it. But I'm interested in why tissues fail. Okay, and I've, I, whilst I started off on bone, I'm still, I'm, I've gone a bit soft in my experience. So I'm more interested in after, uh, cartilaginous tissues, okay, at the moment. So why tissues fail? What mechanical loads can they take? And there's not much we can do about that. Loads are what the body puts on them. Okay, but how do the tissues respond to those loads is important. Uh, and how do the tissues re uh, respond in degeneration agent? Okay, is there anything we can do about it? In particular, can we prehabilitate the body? If, we, if the tissues are starting to go wrong, can we put external loads onto those tissues by means of physical uh, exercise to uh, make the tissues better themselves, preventative? So we want to predict what's happening and then to prevent. And if something has gone wrong, can we rehabilitate afterwards? Okay, can we again put some exercise on? To, and if not, uh, can we stick something, uh, stick a piece of tissue in to recover? And to be able to stick that piece of tissue in, you need to know the mechanical properties of what you've got to put in. Also, a lot of tissue mechanics um, in, in mathematical models is needed if, um, if you're interested in larger structures. Okay, so for example, uh, modeling of the spine, okay, you might not be precisely interested in the uh, little fluid movements in the nucleus pulposus, but you're wanting a general behavior of what's happening in the intervertebral disc, so you can see how the growth shape of the spine moves with, with certain loads. So that's another important area as well. So that's um, my understanding. Uh, is there any way we can get rid of that, Nick? 
drag it off the screen. Drag it off the screen. I could drag it middle. Oh. Yeah, the bottom will drag separately. Better, better now. Let's get rid of my strap line. There we go. That's that's a lot better. Okay. Well, right. I'm gonna, as I said, I want to start off with an experiment. Give you some experimental data. And what I've got here, please don't touch it. Um, it's not human. It's cow. Okay, it's a bit of cow tail. So it's nucleus pulposus and the cow tail. Okay, nucleus pulposus is quite the, the tissue which I use quite a bit. Okay, uh, it's just, it really is a gelatinous splodge. Okay, um, I don't know why I've got these gloves on, it's any sort of kitchen material, you know, handle meat all the time. So it, it really is quite soft and squidgy. Okay, and that's the type of, uh, I'm going to just put some water in there now to rehydrate it, but I've got another sample in there. Okay, so you can see uh, the rough size of it, and I'm going to put some water in and we'll look at the size of it afterwards. Which one's still? Don't put spike here. <laughs> it only likes still water. Okay, sample. This is Cara, one of my students, okay, um, and she's going to be operating this machine, hopefully if I switch over. What I'm going to be doing, uh, lots of these tissues are tested in confined compression. Okay, so we get a bit of tissue, we combine it laterally, and then we put a load on it and switch it. Okay, so if you want to press go, and it's your fault if it doesn't work. Okay. So we're putting in a slow ramp, okay, and this is the load increasing, increasing, and then it's relaxing off. Okay, that's the end of the ramp phase, and it's a slow uh, relaxation. So it wasn't, it didn't peak as much as the last one, okay, so we've got our scale slightly wrong, but what I wanted to show you is, is this relaxation phase, okay, it's very, very dramatic, it's very, very quick, okay. So, whenever you, and it will just uh, keep on going. Okay, so that's a, a live experiment. Okay, all that work for 30 seconds. Okay, um, well, let's wait until we collect the data. Okay, so is it finished? Yeah. Is it good? Okay. So, hopefully, and uh, you believe me, there's a bit of liquid for process in that machine, and hopefully that you can see that there's significant time dependency. Um, well, then you say, well, that's really fine. It's, it's soft and squishy. What about other tissues? Well, bone as well. Okay, and here's the, the bigger brother of my uh, this uh, baby bows, and that's big bows. Okay, we have fun in our department. Okay, so I've got a bit, and here's a bit of um, cortical bone, uh, bovine femur. It's not even in a water bath, and it's just ripped, and it's just a really crude experiment. Okay, and even that, if you put a ramp, hold, uh, st st strain on it, you get significant, almost immediate stress relaxation of about 10%. So even in the real, in, in bone, which is one of, the, you know, uh, one of the harder tissues in the body, you're getting significant stress relaxation straight away. So, I want to know how we can model that. How can we predict that behavior? And there are, in general, two broad classes of theories um, that can model that. Viscoelasticity theory and poroelasticity theory. And so the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is going to be looking at those particular theories and what, how they're constructed. I know some of you have got a tissue mechanics background, which is great. So I, I apologize if some of this you know before. But, uh, if you haven't, then um, it'll be quite, hopefully, quite interesting. I'll start off with viscoelasticity because um, 
this town, Glasgow, is uh, very important for viscal elasticity. Okay? Uh, some of the major things in viscal elasticity are named after people who worked in this town. Okay? So, I'll explain a little bit later. But a spring is uh, one element of a viscoelastic model. And a spring, if, here we've got time along the bottom. If you put a strain into it, a nice step strain into a spring, you get a step stress. Likewise, if you put a step stress into a um, material, you get a step strain. There's no time dependency in a spring. Things happen instantaneously. So that's one element of a visco, uh, that go, com component of viscoelasticity. The other one is a dash pot. And a dash pot works, the stress in the dash pot is proportional to the strain rate. Okay, so you put a, a step stress in, okay, and you hold that stress level, and this strain just keeps on growing and growing and growing and growing. And that's the definition of a fluid, that under a finite stress, you get infinite strain. And viscoelasticity is all about putting combinations of springs and dash pots together, okay, in various formats, in various configurations. It's a combination of the solid and the fluid elements. So we've got solid-like behavior and fluid-like behavior. And the two configurations that build up models are, you can put them rather like electronics, you can put them in parallel, or you can put them in series. And the parallel one, if you do the maths, which is in the book, you can show that uh, the stress is, e is uh, equal to this. And for the series element, you get a slightly more complicated e equation, but this uh, differential equation describes the behavior of this. So conceptually, I just want you to engage for 20 seconds and think. Um, in the definition of a, uh, a fluid, and a, a fluid is something that gives uh, infinite strain for a finite stress, is one a, a solid and one a fluid, or are they both solids, or are they both fluids? I won't ask you to shout out, but I'll give you 10, uh, 10 seconds to think about it, and then I'll go through the answer, whilst I get a drink of water. Yeah, of course you can. Uh, last slide, if you apply step strain, what would you get for stress? Ah, interesting. I didn't put that slide up. You get the, an instant, uh, infinite, stress. Instant, infinite stress, a still act function. So you get that. Okay. It should be in the book. Okay, so if you, let's conceptualize. If we put a step stress on this, okay? This can't deform immediately, okay? But it slowly does deform out, and as it deforms, this string, uh, this spring starts to elongate, and this puts, uh, stops it uh, creeping forever. So this is a solid, okay? If you put a step stress on this, okay, and we hold that stress, well, this immediately deforms, so we get an instantaneous deformation, but then this dash pot just keeps on flowing and flowing and flowing. So this representation is a fluid. And I'm, the reason why I'm, uh, I'm glad you're here in Glasgow learning about this is that we've got Kelvin solid, and there's a river Kelvin going through Glasgow. Kelvin was a person who went to the University of Glasgow, and also Maxwell fluid. And these are the names given. There's anyone French here? Uh, the French know this is the Voix for solid as well. They were about the same time. Okay, so I didn't want to yeah. So sometimes it's known as the Voix solid as well. Okay, but Maxwell and Kelvin were two people in, inherent in Glasgow. And so um, a couple of hundred years ago. So we've got solids and we've got fluid elements. And so whilst these are uh, ways of representing uh, just two elements, they're not very good for tissues. No tissue behaves in either way. But, so you can build up lots more complicated models. Okay. Typically, the three-parameter solid uh, is used quite a lot for bone. Um, the four-parameter fluid is called Berger's equation, and that's, quite, that's used quite a lot as well uh, for more softer tissues. So you can use this theory to uh, combine springs and dash pots in any combination you like. 
And the more springs and dash plots you have, the more complicated the equation. Okay, these uh, equations are more, uh, most easily solved for step stress and step strain. Okay, and the solutions to these equations in step stress and step strain are in terms of exponentials. Okay. But Fung noticed in that, or uh, it's, it's been known for some time that lots of different combinations of exponentials can have the same overall effect. So actually, I sort of, what those parameters mean, but from the resulting equations is a bit dubious okay if you fit if you fit data experimental data to these uh, these equations and you get parameters out a different set of parameters will also give us an equally good effect okay so step stress and step strain is, is not the best way to characterize tissues with viscoelasticity okay so in viscoelasticity Quite often or not, oscillatory loading is used in this case. Okay, and if we have a stress going into a nice oscillatory stress going in, we get a time delayed strain. Okay, you put a stress in, and a little bit of time later, the, the strain uh, catches up with it. Okay, and these are the two uh, functions that provide that. And um, you can write these in terms of the uh, uh, Euler's equation. So this is the strain, and this is the stress, where A and B are these functions. We can determine what's known as dynamic modulus, okay, as, as equal to stress over strain, just in the same way Young's modulus is stress over strain for a, a linear material. And, and that turns out just to be B over A, or uh, the amplitude of the stress divided by the amplitude of the strain times is E to the I delta, where delta is the difference in phase, the phase difference. Okay. Um, and you, you define two things generally in this uh, um, in these experiments. One is the storage modulus, and this is akin to the Young's modulus. Okay, it represents the amount of uh, um, energy that can be stored and returned. It's the elastic strain energy um, in a viscoelastic material, and also the loss modulus, and that's representative of the the energy lost during cycle. Okay. So if the loss modulus is really uh, low and the storage modulus is really high, it's, it's a very stiff, uh, almost elastic-like material. And if the storage modulus is zero and the loss modulus is really high, then it's like a fluid. Okay. And generally, every, all materials are somewhere in between. Okay. The nice thing is the, the time difference, this delta, which is uh, this minus this, this, type, this phase lag is equal to this, uh, the loss modulus over the storage modulus. And this allows you to do these uh, make these calculations really easily. Experimentally, what do we do? There's two ways we can do it. Uh, using a machine like this, we can put in a frequency, a nice oscillating frequency, and we can work out that phase difference. Uh, obviously, we get uh, a radial displacement in this way. Slightly dodgy because we're getting frictional issues. Okay, not perfect. The more conventional way of doing it, and this is conventional rheometry, is you put a load on it and you put a rope, um, a torque on it. Okay, so sometimes you see E double dash and E dash for storage and storage quantities, and sometimes you see a G in terms of shear. Okay, both are uh, very much equivalent. There's two ways of doing it. Now, the storage modulus, the loss modulus, and uh, delta, are, according to the, the new equations, are frequency dependent. Okay? And the different models in that table, which I showed, all those different combinations of sprints and dashboards, they'll all have different relationships of. Um, these parameters with frequency. Mathematically, you can extract, uh, extract those quite readily. So what you can do is you can do a frequency sweep of your tissue and see what uh, behavior across the frequency uh, range your tissue demonstrates. And that gives you a clue as to what model is most appropriate for that tissue in terms of springs and dashboards. 
so you can go backwards and uh, work things out. So when people did that, in the, they said, well, actually, most of these tissues are fairly frequency independent. Okay, and so they've got a very, very similar response irrespective of the frequency that they're using. And so um, in the early 90s, uh, Fung developed the quasi-linear viscoelasticity, which is essentially an infinite number of those Kelvin solids, uh, springs and dashboards. So if I go back, oh, one way. You might have heard of quasi-linear viscoelasticity before. So here's a five parameter solid. Okay, we've got a spring and a Kelvin solid and a Kelvin solid. And if you imagine another Kelvin solid and another Kelvin solid and an infinite number of Kelvin solids, that's a, the, that's effectively uh, quasi-linear uh, viscoelasticity, an infinite number of Kelvin solids. And mathematically, it simplifies quite nicely uh, to a, a low number of parameters. Okay. So that's a really brief overview of viscoelasticity. Biphasic theory uh, was developed in the 1940s, originally in soil mechanics. Okay, by Terzaghi and subsequently by Bio. Uh, and these so, uh, so there's lots of literature on bi uh, poor elasticity in soil mechanics. Um, in the 19, uh, early 80s in Columbia University, Mo, uh, BC Mo is the main architect of the biphasic theory, and he developed a biphasic theory for articular cartilage. I don't know whether they they built on each other, they didn't reference it, but these things was uh, this developed um, independently, I think, of this. But effects, it's been shown since that they are effectively the same uh, theory. Again, I've, in your tutorial notes, there's a, the whole, I've got a really simple, non-rigorous mathematical derivation for you. Okay? I haven't been able to find a, a simple non-rigorous uh, non derivation of this, these equations before, so hopefully you'll find it useful. Okay, sometimes the, deriva the original 1980 paper, I'm sorry if you're, if you're listening to that, <laughs> it's really it's impractical for me. Anyway, so you can have, uh, the way it's built up, you can have a mass balance, okay, so mass in equals mass, uh, or mass in minus mass out is equal to the change in mass, and that gives you this equation. We've got a momentum balance, effectively saying the, the, uh, the force is balanced on this cube, and this gives you this equation. And then you stick in an, an empirical law of how fluid flows through uh, the tissue, Darcy's law. So this is the relative uh, velocity of the solid and the fluid is equal to the, the permeability times the, the gradient of pressure. It's negative because pressure, uh, water fluid goes from high pressure to low. We need to have a constitutive behavior for the fluid, uh, for the solid. And Hooke's law is the simplest one to start with. Okay, and so we can use a Hooke's law representation uh, where uh, HA is known as the aggregate modulus. And the aggregate modulus is, um, is, this, is basically the Young's modulus in confined compression. Is represented by this. So if we know our Poisson's rate, your aggregate modulus is exactly equal to Young's modulus if Poisson's ratio is equal to zero. And you combine all of these things in the way I've shown you in the tutorial booklet to give you this biphasic equation. And this was the equation that, um, created in the 1980s. Okay. And there's been lots of recent extensions to this. So there's lots more extensions, and unfortunately, time prevents me from going into any of these. I know that there are people in the audience who are experts on hyperelasticity, and I'm, uh, I'm not. So um, hyperelasticity, for those that don't know, is um, an elasticity theory for when deformations get a lot larger and uh, linear elasticity falls over, is inappropriate. You can also, um, in the solid phase, put fibers into it, or also, uh, quite often now, people are putting a viscoelastic model in for the solid phase as well, and they combine these two things so we can get poorer viscoelasticity. But so these three ex common extensions 
these fit in to this HA and the constitutive behavior here and how that varies. An important theory extension is that permeability is how easy fluid can flow through the tissue depends on how much you squish it. If you squish it, you compress all the pores, okay, make the pore size really small, and therefore it's uh, more difficult for fluid to flow through. Okay, and this is, there's lots of different equations of how that permeability varies. Um, most of them are empirical, very few are an, sort of analytical, and so um, an exponential one seems to work quite well. Uh, that's uh, where here, this is um, strain. This is the uh, permeability at zero strain, and M is a parameter that needs to be found. Okay. Nowadays, there's uh, a program called FE Bio. Has anyone heard of FE Bio before? Good, yeah. FE Bio is a free for, free for academic use. Okay, if you want to commercialize, you have to pay. Okay, but it's a finite element solver, and it has all of these models in it, including viscoelasticity, including fiber reinforcement, including nonlinear large deformation theory, lots of hyperelasticity models in it. Um, it's really useful, okay? The, um, the way to construct models is a bit clunky. So the, the first, you know, but for material models, it's really great. So getting complicated geometries is quite difficult for me, but material modeling is, is fantastic. It's got a large variety of material models. So we don't need to um, construct our own code to solve these things now. We, anybody can just download, register and download it for free. And within a, a day, you can start analyzing these material models. So if you haven't got FE Bio, I really recommend you uh, looking at it. In fact, there's a work uh, as part of time out, as part of my scientific coordinator for this uh, ISB. There's a special session on FE Bio. I can't remember what day it is, Wednesday or Thursday, I think, uh, when the general session is one of the people who's. Um, uh, it's going to be talking about FE bio capabilities, so please go to that if you're interested. Okay, so we can use the FE bio to do some numerics. Okay, and this is one I, I ran a couple of days a uh, couple of days ago, just to show that viscoelasticity and poroelasticity, and I'm sure I could get those lines to fit better. They can predict exactly the same surface behaviour in terms of time. In terms of parameters, stick a couple of so this is a three-parameter viscoelastic model and a three-parameter biphasic model, and you can had I tweaked to them a little bit more, you can get a, a little better fit. So you can see mechanically and that these things are very similar in in terms of surface stress. Okay, and, and surface stress is the only thing that we can measure on a machine like this. We put a load in, and we can measure the surface stress. So in just by getting doing a test, I don't know which theory is more appropriate. It's clear stress relaxation in both, and both theories can do that quite happily. But what about the internal mechanisms? What do the theory tell us about these? Well, this is a viscoelastic model, okay? And I'm putting uh, in uh, a ramp strain here. So the different colors uh, starts off with zero strain, a little bit of strain, and then at the end of the ramp phase, and this is the hold phase. So you can see that viscoelasticity theory has no depth dependency. It's homogeneous all the way through. And these are the outputs from the FB bio. So you put that strain in, and the stress, okay, you get um, zero stress, corresponding to zero strain, an increase in stress, you get a peak stress, and then it goes back to green again as the stress drops off and it gets closer and closer to red. So you can see that there's stress relaxation going on. That's what, I, I couldn't get the legend nice and big, unfortunately. Okay, so this is the nice color, graphical, uh, color graphic way of just that previous graph that I showed. Okay, so we got uh, a homogeneous um, st stress and then uh, it relaxes homogeneously as well. Biphasic theory 
has some internal structures to it. Okay, again, this is um, a ramp stress, uh, a ramp strain. So we've got, it doesn't matter whether this is stress or strain, because it's the stress or strain in the solid. So we put a, um, a strain on it, and to cope with this, the top um, compresses immediately. Okay, whilst the bottom, the bottom of it, which is uh, on, in this sort of configuration, doesn't. And so we're just getting very localised deformation at the top. And then this localised deformation starts to diffuse out. Okay, so it's, it's basically a, a, sort of a diffusion equation. And so we get stress and strain diffusion throughout the, the, the body until we get to a homogeneous stress and strain. The fluid pressure here, uh, it's done, uh, follows a similar pattern. Zero to start with, with zero deformation. There's zero bound, uh, fluid pressure on the boundary, and that's the boundary condition where we're uh, allowing fluid to flow out. Okay, but something's got to resist this, this the applied stress, and so we get an increase in fluid pressure uh, in the ramp phase, and you can see that there's a fluid pressure, pressure gradient uh, going from high fluid pressure to low fluid pressure, and so fluid is being squished out of the material. At equilibrium, fluid pressure is zero throughout. Okay, and that's uh, it in uh, written words. Uh, is there any evidence for this? Well, both um, viscoelastic and the poroelastic are made to match the, the surface stresses, but the difference between the models is in the the internal mechanics. And I haven't found a paper that has managed to show that when you squash a bit of articular cartilage, the top bit deforms, but the middle bit or the bottom bit doesn't. I don't think there's any evidence out there to, um, that I've found. I may be wrong. I haven't looked in the last few months, but that uh, there's no direct ev experimental evidence to give one theory uh, credence over the other. Confined compression. So let's talk about unconfined compression. Unconfined compression is not this setup. It's, uh, we've got two platens, uh, impermeable this time, and we compress them, and the materials are allowed to squish out that side as well. Okay. And if you work out the uh, the mass, it's just a radial uh, diffusion equation. Okay. So. This is what the actual stress looks like. And here we, we compress it, um, and this, this stress increases, and the stress increases, and then it slowly um, goes back to equilibrium, as you would expect. And this is the same for the biphasic theory. We're getting some radial variation here, okay, in the actual stress. But the actual stress is not the, uh, the interesting bit. Okay. The biphasic model predicts uh, some really nice uh, things going on. This is what I want to concentrate on. Okay, so we've got in the ramp phase, we've got a load on it, and it starts to squish out. Okay, this is uh, and let me try and so this is the. Um, Let's think of it in terms of strain. Okay, we've got um, for this to squish, we're getting a, a, a high, a, an increase in tension in the middle bit. So this is the middle of the tissue, and this is the outer edge. Okay, and we squish it down. The outer edge is still zero because that's a boundary condition of zero fluid pressure. And so, but this is squishing out, and so. Um, there's an increase in there's a tensile force here, okay? And this tensile force in in the inner uh, region is quite considerable. And then in the whole phase, we've got this this blue, which is a tensile force, and it it pulls this uh, boundary back in again. Okay, we've got the outside boundary still at zero, okay? But we've got and this. Eventually, at equilibrium, this inner uh, region becomes um, 
zero uh, strain again. So we're getting the major characteristic of this, we get some really nice internal mechanics, but also we're getting radial recoil. So we're squishing um, the tissue. It immediately squishes out uh, because fluid is incompressible. And then as the fluid starts to uh, leave the tissue, it radially re recoils back in. That phenomenon doesn't happen in a viscoelastic body, the motion of elastic recoil. Okay, And this is the major differentiator between the two models. Okay, And you can read that at your leisure. So the main difference uh, between viscoelastic and biphasic uh, theories is in unconfined compression, there's a radial recoil, um, but uh, biphasic theory, but not for viscoelasticity. Again, I'm asking, is there any evidence for this? Okay. Again, we can both both models can predict surface force, but is there any evidence for the biphasic model having radial recoil? Now, this is a really tricky experiment to do because you want to compress something with zero um, friction. Okay. It's that zero friction coefficient on the top and bottom, which is really uh, important to try and get experimentally. I managed, we managed to do it. Okay. So, a few years ago, one of my students was uh, very diligent and just worked and worked and worked. And we worked out with lubricant after lubricant after lubricant. And it's one of the standard ones you can get in a pharmacy. Uh, which worked the best, okay? And you can see that this is nucleus pulposus. We can, this compression pattern squishes down. We had a, a video extensometer looking upwards underneath the tissue. And we had a, a series of markers that ex expanded out. And this is Poisson's uh, circumferential strain. We did a stress and it, it relaxed off. Radial recoil and it relaxed off. Radial, yes. So these things are in indicative of radial recoil. So this was the nucleus pulposus. He did it once on articular cartilage. And the nice thing is articular cartilage was much well, This is Poisson's ratio. And on an immediate application of the load, you get a Poisson's ratio of 0.5, which is what fluid should be. OK? And so it's, it's demonstrating that there's no relative movement of the solid and fluid. And then there's the Poisson's ratio dropped off to about 0.15118, something along those lines. We've only got one data set of that. So the theory, biphasic theory, predicts that if you squish it, it should expand at 0.5 to so Poisson's ratio of 0.5 and then uh, recoil back. And so at different ax, uh, levels of axial strain, we showed this was a very significant effect for nucleus pulposus. Okay. Um, so because that hasn't been um, doesn't happen in viscoelasticity, where this is the first sort of evidence to, to show that biphasic theory is much more appropriate for these tissues. So if you're dealing in three-dimensional applications and you're interested in time, uh, time dependency, then I think, if, especially if you're squishing a, an invertible disc, that radial recoil is quite important. Um, in the interest of time, <coughs> I won't, I won't say this. All right. as I said, FeBio is uh, can be used to now extract material parameters as well. Not only can it predict behaviour, it can also be used to extract the material parameters out. And whilst I'm actually speaking, I'm going to ex extract the material parameters for that piece of tissue uh, there. Okay. Now, all experimental data has biological variation in it. Okay, so the parameters that you get from these models, they vary quite considerably from specimen to specimen to specimen. So everyone who works with biological tissues knows that you've got to do lots of experiments and to hone in on a certain answer. I think there's a question whether this is a real phenomenon, okay, or whether the biological vari variation is a symptom of poor experimental control and parameter extraction. Okay, and different people are doing different things, or probably a combination of the two. 
more like. For example, parameter sensitivity, if you're using these models, it's very important to understand or try and get a handle on how sensitive these models are to small changes in your parameters. Okay. Um, for example, if you um, if you have a look on this, the solutions, are they insensitive to parameter variation or whether um, they're very sensitive? And, and I think only one study to date has actually looked at that. Okay. And this is a, a picture from that. Okay. And it, it assessed permeability. So if you can imagine a, a stress, uh, a confined compression experiment, very similar to that, where you have um, the stress relaxation going along. And from the equilibrium position, we can predict the aggregate modulus, which is fine. And then uh, the time dependency is dependent on the permeability. So the permeability is dependent on the initial permeability, which is uh, zero strain. And also the nonlinear coefficient, see how that strain varies with deformation. What I've what tried to be plotted here are the R squared values for that fit. So a white value here is a really good R squared value, you know, getting up to one, perfect fit. And black is a rubbish fit. So you can see here there's a band of white. Okay? Where 0.95 goes between about here and here. So a 0.95 correlation is, is pretty pretty good. Okay. And whilst you're um, the way it works is that you can build up a little simplex, and this simplex, um, depending on the values for this, it chooses another uh, value and it chooses another value, and it, it slowly homes in on the right on the optimum solution. It's, this is showing here that there's a wide variety of uh, initial permeability and M, which gives a pretty good fit. So I think these models are quite insensitive to permeability. You're getting a factor of uh, probably 10 um, between 0.1 and 1 here, um, which has a huge uh, change in perm initial permeability by a factor of 10. You can still get a really good fit by uh, changing another parameter in the model. I think that's a problem. Okay, multi-parameter systems. Generally, there's a variety of combinations of parameters that get the same mechanics. Okay, and this is these aren't that complicated models. Let alone if you throw in fiber direction or hyperelasticity or other parameters in there. Another experimental issue. Which, which was investigated in this paper, was, uh, this is the, the stress, compressive stress with time, so you can see the stress relaxation, is what, uh, what data do you use to fit? Okay, you can either fit the data over the whole length, or you can fit data over a little length, or a little length, or you can, you can choose different amounts of data to fit over. Okay. And if you do things numerically, it's really good to have lots of data uh, in a far, uh, when you're collecting data on an FE, uh, in a, a fast-moving environment and not so much data in a slow-moving environment. So how you actually, the sampling frequency is really important and also is uh, what uh, epochs you want to fit up. And the the synopsis of this paper, the finding of the paper, is that where the things are moving, where the dynamics are moving fast, you've really got to concentrate your uh, sampling, uh, your frequency, or your data collection. Okay, and it improves the, not, the goodness of fit measure. Okay, so you really want to t t tailor things, but so how you collect your data varies the parameters that you uh, get out. Again, which that's an experimental issue, and it's sort of we're a, a real. Uh, I think we've got a difficult discussion as to are these data real and real and appropriate. Okay, so in the last um, seven minutes before I give you a break, I want to talk about fluid flow because cells in in tissues need 
um, nutrients, they need oxygen, they need glucose, they need hormones, they need enzymes, and articular cartilage, intervertebral disc, and to a lesser extent, ligaments and tendons are avascular. Okay, they've got no blood supply. So they've got to get all these nutrients by uh, either diffusion or by convection. Okay, which is diffusion is just the movement of the molecules through the fluid, and convection is the gross movement of that fluid. So fluid flow is really important for cellular activity. The composition of uh, tissues, okay, are quite similar. Apart from the nucleus pulposus, which, are on, um, which I've got here, okay, and the nucleus pulposus is about 50 or 60 percent GAG, okay, glycose amino glycans. Now these GAGs are important. Okay. I've got in a little bit of I put in a little bit of this nucleus pulposus into water earlier, and it's just swollen up a bit. Have a look. Okay. It generally it will keep on swelling up. Okay. Okay. It swells up to about four times its size. Okay. It just wants to suck up water, which is great if, if you've got um, if you're standing up for 20 hours a day and you go to sleep for four hours a night. Okay, because then um, your, your spine just sucks up all that water again. It just wants to suck things up. Okay, and that's due to the gags. Okay, to a slightly lesser extent, articular cartilage uh, has those gags in it. The other material uh, are much lesser. Okay, so fluid flow is clearly there's no stress being put on that. It just it just wants to suck things up. And permeability governs the time-dependent mechanics. Of this, this fluid flow in the tissue. So I think we need to, we've got, we've been through a confined compression experiment, we've been through an unconfined compression experiment. Most people don't consider permeation experiments. And a permeation experiment is to have a high fluid pressure on one side of the tissue and a low fluid pressure on the other side of the tissue and you're uh, pushing, driving fluid flow through that tissue. Okay, and if you, at equilibrium, the biphasic equation predicts this. Okay, where this is the external fluid velocity, okay, and this is the permeability and the, uh, the, the aggregate modulus. And you can integrate that twice to show that there's a variation of strain through the tissue. Okay, and if, if, if you think that's linear, then you get a nice linear variation of strain through the tissue by integrating it. Okay. And that is the permeation experiment for biphasic tissues. So this is the equilibrium. You've got a high pressure up here. You've got a low pressure up here. It's driving fluid through here. There's a poor boundary top and bottom. But um, because there's a high pressure here, all the pores are really inflated at the top. There's a low pressure here, so the pores are deflated here. And we get a linear uh, variation in strain through the tissues. Okay, so that's what biphasic theory predicts. The biphasic modeling ignores uh, these gags. Okay, there's no con uh, concept of these gags. And the important, the way, the reason it um, sucks the fluid up is that these gags are negatively charged. Okay, and there's an osmotic pressure wanting to suck up the fluid. Okay, and that's due to the negative charges of these proteoglycans. Okay, so there's two types. Uh, you've got the, the proteoglycans, which are really big, uh, long molecules, and they're really fixed, and they're sort of, they can't move. But you've also got ions in the fluid themselves. Okay, so I'll put that in whatever that water is. It will still have some, a small amount of sodium and chloride in it. Okay, but in physiologically buffered saline, you're going to get uh, sodium ions and chloride ions as well. So we've got... Um, Fixed charge um, and also uh, mobile ions as well. And there's a nice, uh, 1997, um, there's a nice paper which describes the quadrophasic mechanics, including these, um, the effects of fixed ions and also uh, mobile ions. 
So if you put those in, you get the same sort of effect. But here you can see that when, um, because you've got these uh, proteic glycans and they're fixed into the tissue, you're going to get a much higher region of proteic glycan concentration at the bottom than you do at the top because of the deformation. And because you're getting more proteic glycans there, you're getting more mobile ions as well to maintain electron neutrality. So in doing a permeation experiment, not only are you getting a variation in strain fluid, but you're also getting a variation in proteic glycan content or fixed charges and also mobile charges. That's what the prediction of this theory is. Again, is there any experimental evidence? Okay. Do these ion gradients exist? Okay, and what effects do they have on fluid flow? So, we've conducted uh, three experiments. Or the experiment, three deficiencies. Um, we permeated um, deionized water through it. We permeated super, super duper um, high hypertonic solution, three molar NaCl through it. And we also permeated an isotonic solution. Okay, so if we permeate an isotonic solution, okay, both fixed charges and these mobile ion gradients will exist. If you permeate a really hypertonic solution through it, you're just flooding the whole tissue with ions. Okay, you just put so much salt in there, you're just, uh, all these uh, mobile ion gradients disappear. Okay, but you still get the gradients due to the fixed charges. And if you permeate a deionized solution, um, oh, so that all gets rid of all ionic effects, whilst permeating deionized solution just remove the mobile ion gradients. Sorry, my fault. So we compared and contrasted the results from permeating these three different liquids through the tissue. Okay, and this is. Um, apparent permeability and this is the fluid pressure which we applied across the tissue and for the different molar um, NaCl solutions that we permeate through we got different um, apparent permeabilities and we think the only way that this that this can be explained is through um, quadrophasic theory okay so this is our um, uh, physiological saline buffered through it, okay? And when you permeate physiological saline through it, you get the maximum applied permeability, uh, apparent permeability. This is because that this solution allows all the fixed charge gradients to exist and also all the mobile ion gradients to exist. So you've got, in, in addition to the fluid pressure, we've got fixed ion gradients and mobile ion gradients. In permeating and zero molar, we're getting rid of the, the mobile ion gradients, okay, and just having the fixed charges. So that's a little bit less. And, per, and when we permeate a hypertonic solution through, we're getting rid of all the charges because there's, uh, uh, there's so many ions floating about the place, there's, uh, there's no, uh, no gradients at all. And so this result is very consistent with a quadrophasic theory of um, tissue. So all experimental data are in agreement with the quadrophasic theory. I think these, these provide data for indirect evidence for localized strain, because they've got to have that strain associated with it, fixed charge, and also mobile ion gradients. And these ionic gradients can be significantly increased uh, fluid. So the nice thing is that a low salt environment, okay, such as the body, maximizes the fluid flow in the tissue, which is a nice point. So if you are involved in fluid flow in tissue and mechanobiological studies and you're wanting to sort of work out um, how much fluid flow your cells need, then um, you should really think about these more complicated models, triphasic and quadriphasic theory. Looks like that, but I don't I won't hand over to the man. So, in summary, 
biphasic and quadriphasic models were consistent with experiments on cartilaginous tissues more so than viscoelasticity. Okay, they have some really interesting, rich internal mechanics. Okay, and whilst lots of models can match surface stress, okay, surface stress does not validate a model for me. You've got to look at a lot more uh, uh, detail. I think that there are insufficient experiments in this world. I think this this uh, field is very uh, experimentally poor at the moment, and I don't think any of these models are truly validated. Further, I think parameter sensitivity of these models is effectively unknown. Okay, uh, when you're fitting lots of parameters to models and extracting those, the fact that different parameters, um, different combinations of parameters elicit the same effect is a real problem for us. And we've got to develop some really clever experiments to get the, the to get all the, uh, the, um, the parameters out. Uh, ion gradients have been shown to affect fluid flow, and I think if you you must consider these if fluid flow is important to you. So in general, I think uh, because mathematics it might be a little bit more easy than experimentally, the mathematical models have developed a lot faster than experimental ways to validate them. And I think some rebalancing of uh, this field is required and some more uh, clever experimental techniques. Okay, and this field de desperately needs pra um, parameter sensitivity studies, improved and innovative experiments. And these experiments, because of the, the localized stress and strain environments, need to be done on a small scale. So I think I'll leave it there, okay? 